Okay, this is uh, an afternoon session of Journeys in Podcasting, and we're very lucky today to have uh, Stephen Downs with us, uh, who very last minute agreed to, to speak with us. We, we threw together an inquiry. Uh, I'm Chris. And I'm Diego, a uh, technology teacher for elementary school. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for being with us today. You're a writer, philosopher, uh, great educator, mostly a specialist in online learning and uh, like new media technologies. Would you tell us a little bit more about your background, what you're doing right now? Okay, so uh, right now I live in the small town of Castleman, Ontario, Canada, uh, which is near Ottawa. Uh, actually, I grew up around Ottawa, but I've lived all over Canada. Uh, right now I work as program leader in learning performance support systems at the National Research Council of Canada, which is the federal government research agency. I've been here for about 15 years, which is surprising to me uh, a lot because I work for the government, who knew? Um, my academic background is in philosophy. I have a BA and MA uh, in philosophy, both from the University of Calgary, and I did nine tenths of a PhD at the University of Alberta, but as I said before, don't call me doctor, I'm not a doctor. Uh, but I play one on TV. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, and I've been writing, working and writing in the field of educational technology for, I'm not sure how long, 20, 25 years or so. Uh, I worked with Athabasca University uh, during the years 1987 to 94. And really, that was my introduction to the field. And I've been in it ever since. Um, I write software, I do presentations, a lot of conceptual work. And right now, I'm leading a development program. Wow. You're all over the place. Well, we're going to ask you to kind of try to hone in on a couple of different topics today. Uh, and we would love to hear kind of some of the more macro theoretical level as well. Um, so the first thing was that called my attention to you was the presentation we saw about um, the agile learning, uh, agile approach to learning design, and the pitfalls that this can run into when it hits the modern edu corporate culture or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. what we're all existing in. Um, something you said in your presentation was that learning designers uh, are, they're, they're walking students through a predefined process. Do you see hope for their to be tweaks or hacks into that system to create a more agile approach. I'm thinking more like project-based learning, gamification with strong narrative elements. Um, is there hope? Oh, there's always hope. <laughs> there's hope for everything. Uh, what you're asking though is, uh, is there a realistic possibility? Um, I mean, the real problem with, with learning when we think of agile processes is learning is right now, very, very outcomes focused, right? Uh, and it's not just focused on having an outcome, it's focused on very specific outcomes, uh, passing the test, earning the competencies, meeting the objectives. And it's a dominant belief in education that there's either a preferred path to meet that outcome or at best one of the few preferred paths. None of this lends itself to an agile methodology, either in the development of learning resources or in the process of learning itself. Um, but it, when you go outside the school environment, you find the, the exact opposite is the case. Typically, when people are learning on their own, managing their own learning, they're very agile. Their needs shift day to day, their interests shift day to day. And at the start of any given day, they might not be able to tell you what they will learn that day, what resources they will consult, because they're working toward other broader objections and learning is something that's intended to support this. So I think for Agile to become a thing in learning, we need to change our definition of the way we approach learning from learning a certain body of content to helping people accomplish the tasks or goals that they want to accomplish. If you suggest projects and things like that, and that's fine, unless the project is something you're defining, right? In which case it's less fine. But if people are on, on an ongoing basis choosing the path that 
defines the things that they want to do. Uh, you know, what they want to make, what they want to create, what they want to accomplish today, tomorrow in life, then that's what leads us to an agile path to learning. Is it possible? Yeah, eventually. I mean, I don't know if it's the fishbowl or the echo chamber that I create for myself using using Twitter and, and whatever media I can find online, but it seems to be this blossoming thing. Um, but. I'm wondering how much of it is dependent or constricted by our culture of leadership within institutions. Um, if we're not very agile as the adults, as the planners, and that that kind of communication isn't open, um, then you know how does that pass down into the way we approach academics? Sure. I mean, the more top-down and centralized your administrative structure, uh, the more you're going to have a difficulty in establishing an agile path both for teachers and for learners uh, because top-down and authoritarian really means a lot of accountability and accountability not just even for outcomes but for process itself it's not just doing the right thing but it's doing it in the way that they tell you to do it uh, and that's characteristic of fairly centralized systems uh, you know I, I read a lot of people you know, uh, I was listening to Yoke okay, Bankler in the car this morning. I'm reading John Husband recently on, on things like alternative modes of organizing, uh, you know, on the large scale, the economy, and on the smaller scale, our organizations, our institutions, uh, and our enterprises. And when we have a distributed model of autonomous agents interacting with each other, based on various criteria, not just a pure market capitalist idea, because that's very constraining, very abstract, but on, on the basis of actual needs, wants, desires, etc. then you have a mechanism that, that allows for agile, uh, you know, it allows for the, the, the adaptive, short range, but long term goal kind of planning that creates a mechanism where people can work together to build something that meets their needs at that time. So in is like a more, I guess what John Seeley Brown talks about, this situated learning environment um, uh, where you have this idea of dispersed knowledge within a group. And, you know, we use this in kind of shorter sprints with our students to mm -hmm. kind of feed off each other, especially if it's something like as simple as like operating a tech tool. You know, use the dispersed knowledge in your group, ask everyone else around you um, to teach that kind of like collaborative way of working. Um, but that runs into some serious problems when you talk about individual accountability and measurement. Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening within school institutions anywhere? Like who's doing it well? Uh, who's doing individual accountability and measurement well? No, no, I mean kind of the reverse, like, like who's handling the situated learning environment mm -hmm you know, honoring dispersed knowledge within a group where everyone contributes kind of at their comfort level, which you described as the scrum, where yeah. you know, get together and kind of everyone offers what part they're good at. That's a hard question because, uh, you know, I don't do a whole lot of, of, of environmental scan kind of work. Uh, I'm, I'm good at defining, I'm not so good at finding. Um, but, you know, I mean, it is the model that uh, an entity like the MIT Media Lab pursues. Uh, so I, I think that's probably, you know, and I say that without, you know, I've only ever visited Media Lab once. Uh, so, you know, I can't speak with a lot of, of detailed knowledge, but uh, the outcomes certainly seem to sort of speak for themselves. Uh, the Finnish model of, of learning where people, are almost like their own entrepreneurs, uh, forging, you know, learning and developing. Sometimes their own enterprise, uh, you know, sometimes their own activity. That's an example. Um, there's a, a project that I, I looked into a number of years ago called Chaos Pilots, uh, and and basically, again, what they do is they immerse themselves into uh, a public or private project, usually something pursuing the social good or community development. Uh, it may be local, they're based in Europe, or it may be international. 
and they build their, their learning around this activity. Uh, I once, this is now like 15 years ago, uh, met a bunch of people on a boat called the Tribal Warrior, uh, which is uh, an Aboriginal training program. Uh, when I saw them, they were uh, in the harbor at, in Brisbane, Australia. They, they tour all around Australia. And basically, people work and live on a boat going from place to place, and their education is centered around the boat. And there are various other programs like that as well. I mean, I, I forget the name of it, but there's a, there's a, a boat. I remember it because one of their students died, which is not a good thing. But, but again, it's, uh, you know, it's a sailboat. They sail across the Atlantic. Uh, it's a very immersive learning experience. Uh, there's schools in, in Edmonton School Division. Edmonton is a city in Western Canada, and their school division is set up to enable uh, choice in the different types of program that you take. So instead of every school in the division being all the same, different schools pursue different paths. Sure, there's, there's your big traditional high school, uh, in the south end of the city, it's called Harry Ainley. Uh, but there's an alternative downtown high school uh, uh, with with uh, students who sometimes live on the streets. Uh, there are schools dedicated to sports. There are schools dedicated to to culture, to religion, uh, to art, uh, a variety of topics. And so each school allows individuals to form their own interests. Uh, the Royal Winnipeg Ballet runs a high school. Uh, it's a high school for aspiring ballet dancers. And so their focus is on their dance, but the school supports you know, the, the, the total person as they develop to you know, become a professional dancer sometime in the future. Those are a few things off the top of my head. There, there are tons of examples like that. I know that you know we, we think that all the, all the schools are you know regimented top down must follow common core or whatever and that's a picture that something sometimes presented to us but when we actually go out and look at what educators are doing uh there actually is a huge amount of variety well i mean we work in a pretty large institution and even like you know what is institutionally the correct way to plan and do everything and then when you go from class to classroom I've had the benefit the last four years of working individually with teachers um, and there's giant differences in how all of that is interpreted and who has a more inquiry based approach. That's kind of what I was asking it is sort of like ways to work within a pretty structured environment, but keep it as inquiry based and as, as agile as possible. Uh, you know, we use something called understanding by design mm -hmm. and so how to take something like essential questions and how to get kids to produce those even though you're kind of guiding them through the carefully chosen content where there's not so many paths for them to choose, but to have them at least generate the inquiry. Yeah. I think kind of stepping in that direction. Do you see this, all this agile approach, and this is more of a bigger kind of meaning of life type thing, is this a reaction to kind of a global imperative that we'll have to solve problems um, as a species or as a group, not only at the local level, but we'll have to be working with groups of people that could be very, very far away. And we have to be thinking not only about our own individual need or our own institutional need, but the need of the environment around us. Do you think this is something that's happening just because of that? Or you know, why, why is this happening? Well, it's happening as a result of need. Uh, and and there's, there's a bunch of different needs. I think that if the 20th century taught us anything, and, and, and we really hope it taught us something, because by and large, it was a rotten century. Uh, I think that if it's taught us anything, uh, centralization and especially authority-based centralization does not work. It's not an organizing principle for society. There's a bunch of reasons for that, but the simplest way of doing, of, of explaining it is, after a certain point, society becomes too complex to manage centrally. And, and the, the reaction to this, and we've been going through this for the last little while, is this, uh, okay, if 
government can't do anything, let's turn everything over to free market capitalism and let the market decide. And what we have discovered in this century is that doesn't work either. Uh, that's a terrible solution because there are many imperatives in society that cannot be decided on the basis of uh, individual uh, reason based on greed. Uh, people need to take into account the rest of society when they make their decisions. So you need this, this middle point between centralized you know, uh, five-year plans and and Rand style individualism where you try to stomp on everyone else. So you need this mechanism that allows you the autonomy and freedom that you need in order to operate in a complex environment, but also enables you to draw on and requires you to support the remaining society, the remaining ecology, the world and the community around you. you. You need that world, that ecology, that community in order to be successful. Um, and uh, So what, why is it, and as far as what I see, is that a lot of this innovative scrum, agile kind of thinking, design thinking, uh, you know, really popular in education right now is definitely that, um, has, has largely come from the business corporate world. I mean, when you look at design thinking, you know, that's, that's the Kelly brothers, and, and that's finding a better way to use empathy for the user to design better projects. And yet we've turned that around and find better ways to make school experiences better for teachers, for students, or the social action that it's been applied to. Um, do you think, well, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> like, wh why, why are some of the most innovative things coming from the industrial sector? Uh, well, I'm not really sure they're coming from the industrial sector. Uh, I wouldn't say Scrum comes from the industrial sector, for example. It's used a lot there. But if I had to trace an origin to it, you know, I, I think it has roots, probably, in things like open source software design or certainly online software design where you have to allow programmers to work in a self-managing and self-organizing way because otherwise they won't work for you uh you know and, and these projects don't get developed at all and i think that you know i think that it's only reluctantly that the industrial sector and 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 pretty much anything outside the uh, you know, the volunteer and social sector. I think it's only reluctantly that they adopt these practices. I mean, that's the other history of you know, the last 50 years, if you will. Um, the entire world did not become uh, based on market forces. People kept volunteering. People kept uh, working toward nonprofit and socially good objectives. Uh, despite being told that everything has to be done for a dollar, right? And when you work that way, you have to work cooperatively because there are no market exchanges. And it's this cooperation that's turning out to be the better mode of organization, the more efficient mode of organization, the more responsive mode of organization. Well, you said in well, another one of your uh, talks available online where you talk about network learning, learning and self-organized learning, mm -hmm. that the content really isn't as important as getting together and generating conversations. So that being said, how do we start to like, you know, incorporate that more in, in, in a meaningful context at schools? <laughs> well, at schools is pretty hard because at schools it's all about the content, right? It's all about getting people to learn and remember the content, and then you know the the, the learning outcomes are what content can you remember? And I think that I'm quite convinced of this that the content is almost meaningless. I won't say it's completely meaningless because we actually do need to know things. Uh, otherwise, you know, we would die. Uh, so there are things we need to know. 
but I don't think there were certain specific things that we need to know. And I do think that these things that we know function as more as a mechanism to draw us on, to engage, to create, to produce, and to carry on our lives. Uh, you know, there's probably very little stuff that you must know how to do in order to survive. I guess you have to know how to eat, but even there, like there's all kinds of ways of eating that would work. So, go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say that this is a perfect uh, entrance to a couple of other topics. I was just listening to Yong Zhao on the Teach Thought podcast a couple of weeks ago, and mm -hmm. he spoke about this exact thing. Teach Thought is saying we need to be teaching kids how to think, as opposed to like teaching them content. And, Young yeah. Zhao's approach was, well, you have to have content to think around. So, I mean, the content is still a critical piece in the whole, like, teaching thought. You have to, you know, at some point you have to engage with the content. Um, but, but not any particular content, right? It's sort of like pipes, right? Pipes aren't very useful unless something's flowing through them. Yeah, okay, we get that. But it doesn't have to be water. All kinds of stuff can flow through pipes. And you can learn plumbing as an abstract subject. Yeah, you kind of have to know a little bit about water, but, but you know, you don't really have to. I like it, the pipes and the water. <laughs> um, in your blog post yesterday, I think this relates really well to your idea of personal and personalized learning. Mm -hmm. And I know this has been trending a lot, at least on my Twitter feeds it has, is this whole idea that we're going to be able to design this experience called personalized learning and kids are going to be able to get in front of a machine and you know it's going to give them the right content at their level and they're going to be able to progress in this way you know Khan Academy times 10. Um, could you give us your thoughts on, on that? So what, what I said in that short little article is that personalized learning which is where you take some system and you change some variables and, and you tweak some options in order to adapt it for individual tastes, presupposes that you know the different types of learning that a person is going to have to do, the different kinds of choices that they're going to have to make, and where they need to end up in the end. And by contrast, personal learning instead of us providing all of this for you and somehow magically getting it right years in advance, you make these decisions for yourself at the time of learning. So you're adapting to your own particular circumstances yourself rather than us trying to plan for what those could possibly be. It's a different approach to learning. In personalized learning, we provide the learning, you just do it. In personal learning, we provide the support, the encouragement, the tools, but you have to build the learning yourself. You have to organize the learning yourself. And the point that I'm trying to make too in that short article is that if we want people to be able to learn for themselves, if we want them to be good learners, they have to be able to learn for themselves. We cannot, as a society, afford, in any reasonable sense of afford, all the instructional design, all the teaching, all the educational systems that we would need in order to provide learning for all the people that need learning, especially when we think of learning as something that everybody does, and everybody does not just for a few years, but for a lifetime. It would take more resources than we have in society. So people have to be able to learn for themselves. And the best time to do that is when they start learning. Yeah, you've, you've mentioned that uh, personal learning uh, is truly based on self-organizing uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've also said that meaningful learning happens when you are truly engaged with authentic problems. Right. In one of your blog posts also you, you wrote that, you know, uh, it should include meaningful learning should be based on real conversations, having real conversations mm -hmm. about real problems that truly engage the learners and uh, using real artifacts. Yeah. Uh, that being said, do you think that approaches like project-based learning or like following design thinking methods could be a, a kind of okay way to get us there and design better lessons or better learning experiences that are really 
like relevant to to students and, yeah and i know you also talk about uh like 21st century skills and that's what you want like those critical thinking and you, you also talked about the difference between collaboration and cooperation mm -hmm. uh, do you think that those models will kind of get us there at least like while we're working in these structured systems the short answer is yes i mean the short answer is it's way better than nothing right uh in the environment that you find yourself and many teachers find themselves in a traditional learning kind of environment uh your choices are you know try to put in some project-based learning or stand in front of the class and lecture at them but there's a risk and and you have to be aware of this risk uh the these methods the project-based learning design-based learning problem-based learning things like that are not as effective in a given set of in a given period of time with a given set of learning objectives at getting kids to remember those facts right if you want kids to memorize facts probably your best bet is to lecture to them repeat them get them to repeat it have them repeat it over and over again have them practice on those facts give them work examples if memorization is your objective drill and kill drill and kill right but that's not learning mm -hmm. i mean you'd be harming them if you did that but objectively on the tests your scores might be a bit lower if you do project-based, problem-based, inquiry-based kind of research or learning? I mean, from my experiences, and this may just be very particular to my trajectory, but mm -hmm. I've always sort of followed the motivation, like what works with students and like what keeps them motivated and what keeps yeah. them sparking. And that's drawn me more into an ed tech, and ed tech environment and definitely drawn me more to the project-based environment. You talked about, sure. you know, you can't get the software developers to you know, do this for you unless you keep it open and keep it friendly. And that is where I was kind of drawn to design thinking. Well, let's yeah. software developers to learners. You know, if you want them to get super engaged and learn, you're gonna to have to provide these kind of environments. Yeah. You know, I think kids are growing up in this world where they feel more power of their choice, I think. I mean, I've been working in one particular environment for some time, <laughs> um, but I like to think that that's trend, that, that students will expect more from us as institutions and they won't accept just as new teachers come in i believe they won't accept the old hierarchical systems that hopefully we will uh, evolve more into i guess what mit has developed or what john Maida writes about in redesigning leadership and that we'll have a more fluid kind of system where it's all about getting things done and to do that you'll have to partner up with the people who can help you get it done um, in you have seen the evolution of this entire tech ecology around us around us and all the open networking that it's created mm -hmm. where do you see that just going blatantly wrong in particular to education and and where do you see it as most promising sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you try that again <laughs> my stream of consciousness questioning uh, in, in the tech ecology that you've seen develop since like the late 80s you know the beginning of the internet and you know i remember i was in university at that time there was all this hope yeah. that the internet was going to be this oh yeah I, i've got the question now sorry <laughs> i just i just needed like five more words of context uh, okay uh where's it gone completely wrong uh oh there's so much to choose from <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, what I see is that institutions pounce, the first thing they pounce on with technology is these ultra accountability measures where yeah. every little thing can be measured, everything can get a number, and um, I mean, it's, it's kind of one area. Um, but, uh, you know, it could yeah. get worse. <laughs> Workflow processes, online accounting, student information and management systems. Uh, and, and although where they really get it bad is uh, is authentication and security, um, it's just horrible. Um, I mean, I work well. I work in, a, in an enterprise and government environment, and the needs for security are are 
significant, but it makes it impossible to do anything. Um, you know, and, and this whole area of how we design systems is, is in some certain really important respects broken. And it's funny because they, every time there's a security issue, they respond by centralizing, which increases the danger of the threat. And so there's another security inc incident, they centralize more and they clamp down more. And the more they centralize and the more they clamp down, the hard, harder it is to use the system, the more likely people are to use workarounds and the more damage is caused by a single incident. Uh, and, and we just see this cycling over and over. Uh, learning management system, again, big disaster um, for pretty much the same reasons, right? Uh, it, you know, and it started, things started out almost responsibly. Um, you know, uh, the learning management system on the one hand was just a, a set of course tools that a professor could use. WebCT stood for Web Course Tools. And so it was a grade book, it was a notebook, it was a presentation tool, it was a discussion area. You know, really handy dandy tools that you wanted to have when you were teaching university class. Made things a lot easier for the professor. Um, but, you know, over time, the structure of this became more and more the course so that instead of these tools that people could use on an as needed, when needed basis, they got drawn into the form and structure of the online learning course as defined by the LMS. So that by the end of it, you know, by the time we're here now, everybody's doing all the courses in pretty much the same way. One of the reasons why MOOCs were so loved is it was at first a promise of breaking out of the mold of the LMS. Although the MOOC has you know, started out with a lot of promise, but now it's gradually going back to making every course the same kind of thing. And they all look like the courses that were in LMS. Uh, the technology promised us a lot more than it actually delivered. It promised us a lot more freedom, a lot more access, a lot more capacity, but where these things could have actually happened the decisions that were made prevented them from happening. Access, a really good example, right? Mm. Uh, you know, back in 2000, or, you know, when I started doing a lot of this stuff in, in the 90s, we're thinking, wow, technology can make all of our learning content free. All you have to do is buy a computer because uh, once you've done that, then all of the other costs are pretty much taken care of. You know, you don't need printing, you don't need distribution. It should be great. Um, but instead, we got digital rights management. Uh, we got locked down course packages and all of that. And again, the MOOCs promised open learning that anyone could access. But again, you know, the venture capitalists get involved with companies like Coursera and Udacity, and they're clamping down on it. Uh, academic publishing, same thing. We should be, you know, academics don't get paid for producing academic papers. Uh, they don't get paid for doing conference talks. So they should just be able to, to write their papers, share them with their, their, their peers. The best papers would be recognized and you've got an academic discourse that's open to all. And the exact opposite has happened uh, where it's harder and harder to access academic papers. You know, even with uh, open access publication, the publishers got involved in open access publication and started imposing author fees. So you have to pay thousands, thousands of dollars to get a paper into the system. Yeah, you know, that kind of stuff is where it's really gone wrong. Uh, I don't think we've used the internet in a socially responsible way. Mm. Uh, I, I think we've used it to pursue private interests and private profit. And in so doing, we've really gotten a lot less out of this technology than we could have. There are signs it's changing, but there are signs it's getting worse. So I think it's still an open question. 
Yeah, I, I guess our perspective, or at least mine, is a bit skewed because I feel like what it's brought to us in Bogota, Colombia, is access to incredible stuff. You know, the yeah. fact that we can get you online and talk to you the next day in a podcast and then share that with all our peers, like that part is absolutely amazing. You know? Oh, I love that part. Yeah. Um, and so maybe I'm just sort of thriving in these pockets of positivity, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, whereas I, I do feel like, you know, there, there are things around us, even within our institution that like, well, you know, why do we have to do that? That seems a little bureaucratic or whatever yeah. else, but at the same time, it's liberating to teach in this environment and to expose kids to it and, you know, get them super motivated about a lot of this stuff as well. Yeah. Um, but I do sense kind of a, the looming in the distance, like where this could go in the future and the possibility. It, it would not surprise me to find in 10 years, and, and, and this is not a prediction, but it would not find, it would not surprise me to find that, to have an international conversation like this that we would broadcast, that we would need to get some sort of license or pay money or get permission or something. I sincerely hope that that does not happen. And again, this is not a prediction, <laughs> but it would be par for the course, you know. Their last broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Steve, you've also uh, written uh, about, well, we kind of mentioned this before, like uh, when you have learners that are truly engaged because they're following their needs, uh, motivation really extrinsic and intrinsic motivation really propels uh, learning. Sure, exactly. Uh, what are like the best motivation systems that you've seen? Uh, I saw on one of your posts too, you, you talked about badges and one of the publishing companies out there is like launching you know, a badging system or something, but it's going to be like very restricted. Uh, what do you think about yeah. badges, by the way? Yeah, the, that's that's the Pearson badging system, as I recall, uh, which is only able to be used inside the Pearson learning system, which is, like again, lunacy. <laughs> uh, badges are actually a form of extrinsic uh, motivation. Uh, you know, they're they're conveying your achievements to other people, uh, and not by virtue of the achievement even, but by virtue of a sign or symbol representing that achievement. Um, I, I, and I think, you know, I would worry about an educational system that is designed around the idea of earning and displaying badges, because then it becomes about earning and displaying badges rather than doing something for your own good uh, or, or for the social good. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about what the best motivation is. I mean, the best motivation already exists. I mean, and, and our, you know, and half of it is we have to stop demotivating. Uh, you know, I mean, the best motivation is if I had to say anything to cause people to be reflective and to think about what al already interests them. I'm thinking of a, a, of a thing I wrote a, a while back, probably, I don't know how long now, 10 years. It was a post called How to Be Heard. Um, that was back in the days when blogging was big and people were just getting into it. And uh, so it was a post on, you know, telling people how to get involved in blogging, what to do, how to start up, uh, a little bit about how to write, etc. And the big challenge that bloggers always have is they have this blank blogging screen in front of them, just like a blank piece of paper or a blank canvas that you draw on or whatever, and they can't think of anything to write. A big problem, horrible problem. Because people, the first question I ask them, why are you blogging if you don't have anything to write about? Uh, but which is a fair enough question, uh, but. I say to them, look around the room where you're sitting now. Uh, presumably you're at home, maybe you're in your office, which isn't this good, but look around the room. See what's there, because this will reflect what you're already interested in. Look at the books on the shelf, if you have any. If you have plants, maybe you're interested in plants. Do you have a pet? Maybe you're interested in pets. If you have a toaster, maybe you're a foodie. I don't know. 
right? Everybody's different. Everybody has different interests. I, I'm looking at the background there where you are, right? And, you know, like you have, I see some uh, one laptop per child things, and I see a lectern and some squares and things. That tells me, you know, if you're looking around, those are things that you could write about. Uh, you know, you're experiencing one laptop per child, minimally. Um, there's not a lot of background there, so I don't have a lot to work with. But we can put more things in the background. <laughs> and so he goes to put more things in the background. Oh, yeah. Guitar? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So the motivational thing here is to find out where they're at and help them pursue that, right? To, to help them understand that it's not about them doing things for you. It's not about them doing things for other people. It's helping them see that the whole point of this enterprise is to help them do things for them. And so that's where I begin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, you know, even when I was teaching in, in classroom settings, you know, uh, in, in northern Alberta, one road in, forest, 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 snow. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd talk to people there and I'd say, well, I'm teaching you formal logic and we're in the middle of the wilderness. And you might not think that that's useful, but let's imagine some scenarios here and tell me about your lives. Tell me about what happens. Tell me about how you make decisions. And we'd see in their particular lives, in their day-to-day -day lives, the role that, that logic and thinking plays, and now it helps them do the things that they want to do. So I think that would be my answer. Mm. It, it sounds very dewy to me about you know the, the child experience. Mm -hmm. they, they come with all of this front-loaded experience, and yet we mm -hmm. ask them of them abstraction, like you know, study yeah. the whales or you know things they have no real concrete use or knowledge of in their in their immediate life maybe that's another one of these like where did technology get it really wrong or, or for that matter where where did the educational system get it really wrong for the last oh, not quite a hundred years uh, maybe about 75 years we've really been hooked on formalism abstract structures uh, you know, mathematics, formal logic, grammar, uh, rules, principles, mechanisms, all of these abstractions are artifacts. They're all things that we create. And they're all, they're very difficult forms of thought. They're, they're, and they're very narrow forms of thought. And they're the creation of what we call the logical positivists. And the logical positivists say, we have experience, but the function of learning and science is to put this abstract structure on experience. So you must learn all of these abstract structures. But that's not how we learn. It's not how we reason. It's not how we think. Um, you know, our, you know, we should go back to Dewey and people like James and Pierce and August Comte and, and uh, you know, the pre-logical positivists uh, and, and even as far back as him and, and understand that we learn, we know by recognition, not by formalism. Uh, that we think in terms of metaphors, not models. Um, that our knowledge is, in the first instance, concrete and practical, and it's only a very long and often after the fact and rationalizing process to create a logical structure around that. Uh, that, that that's the end point of any sort of discipline in science. And it's not even the discipline or science, it's just the structure that we create in order to rationalize our way of thinking about it. But the actual thinking takes place in concrete terms. Education needs to be concrete. This is what Dewey knew as a pragmatist and an empiricist. This is what uh, he recognized. Education has to be concrete. The creation of abstractions only proceeds 
from a foundation of concrete experience and nothing else. You can't transmit from one person to next purely abstract thought. It just doesn't work that way. I feel like we need a moment of silence after that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it hits very home to us and like what we're doing. Kids are studying about the Arctic tundra yeah. and yet they're living here in Bogota. And so the goal is to try to find something they can do in their own environment that would somehow through a journey map be able to, you know, as abstract as it is, connect. that they would have this concrete thing they can do here yeah. that would connect to how to conserve Arctic tundra or how to conserve you know, habitats that are, that are very far away. And what you got to do is take them to a restaurant and have them go into the walk-in freezer and then say, <laughs> and then and then tell them that in Canada, and this is true, this would be a warm day in winter. <laughs> otherwise, they won't get it. Um, but beyond just sort of the, the sensory experience, um, you know, I, I think our goal is always trying to find a way to build from their own, well, I guess they are sensory experiences if they're dealing with artifacts, for example, that to build that inquiry off of, you know, I'm looking at sort of the Project Zero kind of thinking routines. I don't know if you're familiar with these, but they're very simple routines that get kids to make observations first, just very concrete things about an artifact. And then they and then they do they get they tell what they think about it, which is basically what they think they know about it. Mm -hmm. And then they finally like start to to wonder and, and build inquiry. And by the time you get to the inquiry stage, they've already thought so many ways around this artifact that they are building their own inquiry. So even if it is something like an abstract model or something, yeah. at least it's coming from them, you know, and they're identifying sort of working from what they know as opposed to what I find in personalized learning systems. It's often just identifying what they don't know and now teach them that thing. And they get to play with these things as well and create things with them, I'm assuming, as well, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, the, that, that's the, the most hoping idea is that, you know, it's, it's a physical thing they're building. Yeah, yeah. We've been talking a lot about sort of the makerspace and how the makerspace builds this experiential learning experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, they can be writing on that and, you know, going back and forth between these symbolic forms, yeah. but to make sure that it's not just like one mode of input and one mode of output, but they get a you know, much broader kind of experiential learning. I read this fascinating paper just the other day, which I ran in the newsletter, about the epistemology of makerspace. And, you know, on, on the one hand, you know, you think about it as the whole point is to create new objects and therefore new facts in the world. But that's not really it. What it's doing is allowing you to think about what is common and ordinary as opposed to what is unexpected and unusual. And, and you're doing that via the objects that you can create. And because you can create objects, you're not just dealing with the objects that are around you, that allows you to think about what is common and ordinary in objects in a different way. Uh, you're not limited. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still grappling with the maker culture. And, and I mean, I see so much promise in it. I see systems thinking. I see, you know, after tinkering around with electronics one afternoon, I walk around my neighborhood with a whole new appreciation for lighting, for, you know, all kind of systematic structures yeah. all over the place. Um, There's nothing like electronics, nothing like circuits in any of the other disciplines, really. Uh, even, even plumbing and, and things like that where you think there would be, yeah, okay, sort of, but no. I mean, electricity is its own thing in itself. Mm. It's a fascinating topic. I hated it. <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of revisit these things as an elementary school teacher, and it kind of is a new awakening for all kind of topics. It's kind of fun. I, I can never get my circuits to work. I'd, I'd either get nothing or smoke. There were no like, happy mediums. Well, and, and on the circuit topic, you know, the kid, I, I brought this into a couple of talks, but like the kid who figures out the circuit problem but can't talk about it, but he yeah. got it. Like he just looked at it, you know, tinkered around with it, and is the first one to get the light to go. Um, whereas what we reward in school is often 
you know, you know, you must didactically with language explain it, you know, every step of this process. Yeah. And like I say, language, language, rules, syntax, it's an abstraction. Explaining something in language is this big artificial structure over and above the knowledge that you're trying to create. It's mm -hmm. hard. It's, they're trying to do two very different things at the same time. Where um, can we find you, or if anyone is listening to this, wh where would you recommend they go? You have years of blogging. Do you have top blog posts or your best writings, or um, where's it a good place to kind of get introduced to you? I would go to my main webpage. It's www.downs, that's D O W N E S, dot C A. And everything's there, um, and and just follow the links from there. Great plans coming up. Speaking events, workshops. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to be in the beginning of March. I'm at a, a Ned Tech conference in Istanbul, uh, Ed Tech Summit. It's called uh, in Istanbul. Um, then on. Uh, the 10th of March, I'm doing an online uh, virtual worlds, uh, virtual worlds best practices and education conference. Uh, so I'll be presenting in a virtual world, one that I haven't used before. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, later on in March, I'm speaking at um, World Congress on Continuing Professional Development. This is mostly for the uh, health profession in San Diego. Uh, I'm speaking at a conference in Toronto in early April. I'll be visiting Naples uh, in mid-April. Another online conference later in April. And then the beginning of May, Commonwealth of Learning um, in Kuala Lumpur. And that's my next couple of months. And it goes on like that for the next few months. I've had a period uh, where I've been basically at home for the last three months, but that's about to end in about a week. Mm. And larger projects outside of speaking, uh, do you have any big well, plans? For I'm working on the Learning and Performance Support Systems program, uh, which I lead. I'm launching a MOOC on personal learning, in fact, starting on Monday. Uh, so uh, that's something that you can look for. So uh, again, check my web page and I'll make sure I have something on it. Uh, it might not be there today, but uh, no, it won't be because it's 4.56 p.m. Um, but, uh, but it should be there tomorrow or Monday, so you'll be able to find the link to the MOOC. Uh, of course, it's free. It's only seven weeks. Sign up. Don't sign up. doesn't matter. It's all going to be there. Um, but actually, it's, I'm using uh, Open edX, and it's not that open, so you'll need to sign up for some of the stuff. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, and uh, in that MOOC, I'll be talking about the uh, uh, LPSS program that we're running, the uh, software that we're developing. I'll show some of the version two of the software and talk about why we developed the things that we did. And with any luck, depending on how development goes, I'll be introducing people uh, near the end of the course to the version three of the software. Great. We'd love to check that out. Um, we're going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much for spending this time with us. Sorry that the questioning was so all over the place, but no, that's fine. That's how I like it. Definitely adept at feeling that. We're going to end communications here if you'd stick around online just for a minute or two afterwards. Sure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.